my name is Matan, and today we're going to be talking about learning to learn. So as you guys can probably tell, I'm a pretty big fan of music. I started off with piano when I was about seven, and slowly started adding on instruments as I went along. Originally, it started just a way to kind of fuel my passion and the subject, but slowly, it actually changed the way I look at my life. Essentially, the more I learned, the more I learned how to learn, which is a little confusing, but we'll start from the beginning. This is the learning curve. Um, put simply, it's a very simple way to approximate your skill at a certain thing versus the amount of time you spend working on it. And this is great. This is a very common teaching aid, and it's used in a lot of quotes and motivational posters. What does it actually mean? So we'll start from the beginning. Whoops. Back one. Back one more. This is your spark. This is your initial point of kind of discovery or interest in your passion. For me, this was piano. Um, and there's a lot of talks already about how to find your spark or cultivate it. So for now, we'll assume you already have something you're kind of into. From here, you move into your wonder climb. This part of your curve is the most exciting. Yes, it's true, your instrument will never be as hard as it is right now, but will also never be more rewarding. What you're playing might be simple, but hey, you couldn't do that five minutes ago. And every single small thing feels fresh and exciting. The part of our brain that's trained to respond to instant gratification is constantly flaring at this point, because curiosity is driving the way. Before you know it, you're playing drums. Your mom will be sending videos to her friends and bragging about it. You'll have a bunch of fun out of your newfound skill. But unfortunately, this wave of fun practice wears off. It starts becoming repetitive. The practice starts feeling like work. You get tired or bored of playing the same progressions over and over, and you can become frustrated. You might even want to quit. This is when you enter the plateau. So what is a plateau? This has a couple of definitions, but we'll be focusing on the second one. A region of little or no change. This is the point in the curve where you go, you know what, this sucks, and you hang that ukulele on the wall and never touch it again. This is the point in the curve where that one friend of yours who played piano for a year but quit, quit. And the reason this point is so scary is that it's really hard to tell when you're in it or how long it can last. It can be a week, a month, or a year, and by the time you find out you're stuck, it can oftentimes be too late. And it doesn't have to be just music too. In fact, for a lot of you, it probably won't be. This can be trying to throw a spiral in football or a hard move in ballet or a tricky question on a math test. This is the most detrimental point to learning as a whole. But we'll come back to this. Eventually, you try to search for a way to get out of this hump, and you enter this point, which is arguably the most important one in the whole curve. I call this your sparkle. This is the rekindling of your initial motivation. From here on, you enter the Climb 2.0, which is when you begin another rapid period of growth, usually now from an entire new avenue of your original interest. For me, this was a transition between classical, a period where I felt really bogged down and bored, and switching from that to jazz. This new avenue that let me really discover who I was and invent myself as a pianist. And from here on, this curve continues and repeats and repeats, but now your plateaus become shorter and more manageable, and you have more tools to aid along the way. So I can already hear you in your seats asking me. You're saying, Matan, you're so cute and charming and funny, but how does this relate to learning to learn? Screw you, no one. <laughs> well, it's simple. Every time I pick up saxophone or some other instrument, it's another time that I go down the same curve and get stuck in the same plateau. There's no pill or yoga stretch you can do to learn faster. You still have to practice. But there are ways to maximize your efficiency and reduce the wasted time in the process. The reason I can do what I do isn't because I'm some child prodigy or I'm doing anything special. Trust me, I'm not. All it is is that let's say I'm picking up saxophone and I get stuck. Instead of being frustrated or quitting, I can go, Wait, this same thing happened to me on guitar. I know if I wait about two weeks, I'll get past it. Or if I get stuck on a certain song, I can go, whoa, 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 this same thing happened to me on piano. 
If I choose this style of song, I know I can get past it. And I'll go out, I'll draw this curve on a window or mirror in my house. And that simple act of visualizing it and seeing it in front of you can really help you get unstuck and move on to the next part. And the great thing here is you don't need to have played 10 instruments to do this. Every single person here has faced or overcame a challenge, all of which fall along the exact same curve. And just a simple act of once you put some time to thinking about it, you'll be surprised how good you already are at pinpointing when you're stuck and being able to move past. Whether your thing is a math question, giving a TED talk, or asking out a girl. So great. What now? You figured out you're stuck. Jazz probably isn't going to help you a lot if you're trying to write an English essay. So let's take this English essay example. The key to finding the sparkle, this turning point, at least from what I found, is separation and reapproaching. So let's say you're writing your English essay and you feel stuck and you draw this on your wall. Instead of staring at a blank empty screen, take your essay prompt and type it into YouTube and watch some videos of people talking or debating the topic. Or take your prompt and bring it up to your parents or friends and converse in a separate situation. Then come back with the new knowledge or bare level new ideas that you have. This concept of separation and reapproaching is the best way to not just push past the plateau, but also re inspire your motivation to do it in the first place. So, will drawing on a whiteboard once change your whole life? Probably not. But by memorizing or at least internalizing this graph, you'll be surprised by how much more efficiently you can learn and the results that it may yield. So, here's where it gets cool. If we take this graph and we zoom out, and we zoom out, whoop. And we zoom out, the other way. You get this one massive learning curve that represents your entire life, T-Rex for scale. Every single challenge or trepidation you might run into all kind of meshes together to create this big curve that represents all you face in your entire life. And just like anything else, in the middle, there's a plateau. Now, I'm quite young, for those of you who can't tell, I'm 15. I still have quite a bit more life to experience. But when I zoomed out and looked at my life from this lens, I realized that I was in a bit of a plateau. All these small things like guitar and saxophone definitely pushed me and motivated me, but in the grand scheme of things, they still felt insignificant. And the thing is, unlike guitar, it's much harder to push past the plateau and find your sparkle when you're dealing with it on this big scale. At this scale, we can take all of our terms and little ideas and get rid of them and replace one and a really interesting development takes place. What happens when you don't want to leave your plateau? The truth is, in real life, we're never going to stop learning. Especially at my age, you'll always have school or work, and you'll constantly be gaining small skills along the way. But this slow, constant, and safe progression can at times be worse than just being stuck at a standstill, because you don't actually have motivation to push past it. Pushing past the plateau at this scale requires taking on a new challenge, climbing a new skill ladder, or putting yourself at risk of failure. And that's scary. Pushing past the comfort that comes from what we understand, that comes from pattern and repetition, is scary. Why risk it? Plus, comfort zones are talked about in this almost supernatural scale. It's attached to all these grandiose themes and big concept ideas, and you either have to do it, you should never do it, or it can change your life or break your life. And it can be really intimidating to even begin to approach. Well, there's one really simple reason why you should be pushing your comfort zone. It's really cool. This idea is so often overshadowed or stepped on, but it can be your greatest motivation. I can tell you from personal experience that putting it on the line, risking it all, can be scary. I've messed up more recitals than I can count, made a fool of myself in front of multiple big influences on me, and ran home crying to my parents because of how scared I was. But it's those mess-ups, those mistakes, those mom-crying sessions that push you forward a notch in your curve and set yourself up for success later on. In eighth grade, I was approached to play drums for the string band at my school. They were playing a song called Take Five, which is in 5-4, which might not mean a lot to you, but scared the pants off of me back then. I've been playing drums for about a month at that point, and I went home, put down the paper, and started bawling. I had no idea why I said yes to this opportunity, why I brought on all this extra stress. And I just kept asking myself, why? Why did I say yes to this? But the concert came and went, and it went great and I convinced my mom to let me get a drum set at home. I kept practicing, and then a couple months later, again, I asked myself, why? Why did I say yes to this? When I joined the jazz ensemble here in Mountain View on drums. I was a freshman in a band of mostly juniors and seniors. I had no friends. The conductor terrified me. And more importantly, I was still pretty terrible at drums. But slowly, as I got better and started making more friends, I ended up joining a band of one of them, which I've had some of the coolest experiences of my life. 
whether it was getting to meet and play for senator and presidential candidate Cory Booker, or fulfilling my elementary school dreams of playing in a wedding band. And then, just about a month ago, I faced another push. I had the idea to find and arrange a version of my girlfriend's favorite song, Lucy by Still Lucy, and perform it for her with my band for her birthday. I took the idea to my friend Archish, and we got to work. By which I mean, we talked about it once and completely forgot about it until about a week before we were scheduled to perform. I scribbled up this piece of paper for everyone to read off of and took it to my friends, where they would laugh at the idea or just think it's stupid. I was scared, but at this point, just like with jazz to classical piano all the way back then, I knew this fear, this push, is a good thing. It means you care about what you're doing. And more importantly, it means you should probably do what's scaring you. Thanks to the amazingly talented musicians I was working with, this turned into a great performance in front of the whole school, which we ended up posting, and the original artist, Still Woozy, ended up seeing, liking, and commenting on our post, and then reaching out to us to ask if he could post it on his Instagram of over 157,000 followers. Oop. Oh. And that's really cool. <laughs> You never know what's going to happen when you say yes to an opportunity. But you do know that if you do nothing, nothing's going to happen. I leave in exactly 10 days from today for six months to Italy as an exchange student. I'm terrified. But at the same time, I can go and I can draw out this curve on a window in my house. And I can look at all my past plateaus and all of my sparkles. And instead, squash this fear with incredible excitement. Excitement to push my comfort zone excitement to push past my plateau and dive into the unknown. So, if you're in the audience and you think you might be in a plateau, I don't recommend you pack up and leave the country for six months, but don't be afraid to push yourself, or at the very least, don't be afraid to be afraid. Pick up a new instrument, any of these ones are great. Try learning a new language, or don't be afraid to sign up for that sport or ask out that girl. Because I can guarantee you, that no matter what happens, ultimately, the experience will probably be pretty cool. And once you finally push past that plateau, the view from the top, from the top, is incredible. Thank you.